Hi and welcome back to the supernatural, the paranormal and the totally bizarre with Bowtie videos. Are we alone in this realm? Is there more life beyond our earth borders? Little green men? Strange grey beings? Some say no, some say yes, but there are some that say definitely. Because they themselves have been taken, abducted and sent back to tell the tales. One of the stories is so bizarre and so believable that authorities want you to think it is all made up because it could reveal a whole lot of truths that they don't want you to know. Welcome to episode 10, Alien Abductions. There's one thing spotting a flying saucer or seeing a strange glowing light within the trees of an empty forest, but there's people who claim to have been taken by aliens against their will. Most can't remember what truly happened to them. Some are even unsure if it really did happen but there are others who have their own eyewitness accounts of what went on and they have the weirdest of stories. Let's go together and check these stories out and try and determine whether they are real or just over the top forms of attention seeking. The first widely publicized abduction came in the early 1960s in the small American state of New Hampshire. It was September 1961 and Betty and Barney Hill had been visiting Niagara Falls and Montreal and were heading home on Route 3. It was getting late, around 10.30pm. Betty, out of the car window, observed a strange craft below the moon. At first, she thought it was a commercial airliner, but it was acting erratically, getting bigger and brighter, and not following the normal patterns of an aeroplane. It flew several times into the moon's luminous glow. The couple pulled over to take their dog for a quick walk. Whilst Barney was attending their dog, Betty grabbed their binoculars and took a closer look at the craft. She observed an odd-shaped craft emitting multi-coloured lights. They got back in the car and travelled slowly on their way home down the isolated Route 3 so that Betty could continue to survey the object. As the object got closer, Betty noted that it was about 60 feet long and seemed to be rotating. Suddenly, the object rapidly descended towards their vehicle, causing Barney to stop in the middle of the road. The huge silent craft hovered about 80 feet above the car and filled the entire view in the windscreen. Barney described it as a ginormous pancake. Using the binoculars, Barney claims to have seen somewhere between 8 and 12 humanoid figures peering out of the craft, all wearing glossy black uniforms and black caps. As the craft approached within 50 feet of them, a long structure silently descended from the bottom of the craft. Then Betty and Barney's minds became incomplete and fragmented, and the next thing they recall is arriving home at around dawn. On arriving home, each recalls weird sensations and happenings that they could not explain. Their watches would never work again, the straps on the binoculars were torn and the toes on Barney's best shoes were scraped. In their confusion, they both decided to simultaneously attempt to draw what they had seen. After sleeping for a few hours, Betty awoke and proceeded to put their clothes away. She noticed that the dress she had been wearing was torn at the hem and the zip. A pinkish powder had stained part of the dress also. That morning, Barney had noticed some shiny concentric circles on the car bonnet. In October 1961, the Hills reported the incident to the US Air Force and Walter N. Webb, an astronomer, conducted the first interview. He reported that apart from a few minor details, but in Barney had been telling the truth. Roughly five days after the incident, Betty would start having vivid dreams. She states that she dreamt that the couple had been stopped on Route 3 by a group of alien-looking creatures with very human-like features. The alien, she went on to say, had black hair, very dark eyes, prominent noses and bluish lips. They were short in stature and were grey in colour. After reading the report made by Walter N. Webb of Betty and Barney's interview, the Air Force had questions for the couple. The main question was the missing time. 
that Ian Barney could not explain why it had taken them approximately nine hours to drive a typical three to four hour journey. It was decided that the couple would try to record their encounter under professional hypnosis. Barney, during his hypnosis, recollects moments where the alien's mesmerising stare felt like it was straight into his brain. The other alien spoke in a mumbling kind of language, which he did not understand. Barney also recalls that they, himself and Betty, were taken into the craft and subject to experiments. But he cannot remember the exact experiments, nor could he recall ever being in pain or discomfort. When Betty was hypnotised, her recollections were virtually the same, but in less detail. After this, Betty and Barney Hill went back to their normal lives and nothing stranger than normal happened to them again. It wasn't until five years later when the Boston Traveller newspaper had somehow acquired the tapes from both Betty and Barney's hypnosis sessions and wrote a front page headline on it. It also appeared in several more publications afterwards and continues to this day. Sadly, Barney died of a cerebral hemorrhage in February 1969 at the young age of 46, after which Betty went on to become a celebrity in the UFO community. She passed away in October 2004 at the grand age of 85. Some say this abduction, this sighting, this alien encounter was due to sleep deprivation. Others say it was totally fabricated. But what do you think? Was this an abduction? If it was, why would aliens want to experiment on us? What are they after? Our next story is bizarre enough, but it is also one of the most discredited alien abduction events. Discredited not only by governments, but by ufologists themselves. Reason? Because it is so believable that maybe, just maybe, they don't want the truth to be revealed and UFO nerds are told to discredit it. Driving home after a long day of logging on November the 5th, 1975 in the Arizona Sick Greaves National Forest, 22-year-old Travis Walton and six other crew members spotted an eerie yellow light glowing in the woods near the rugged mountain road on which they were travelling. All the crew members say it was like a golden disc in the woods that started to spin violently. Ignoring warnings from his co-workers, Walton jumped out of the truck and ran towards a saucer-like object that was producing the light because, as he would explain later, he wanted to get a better look at a UFO. He was not to be disappointed. As it turned out, the aliens apparently were just as keen to get up close and personal with him. A bolt of blue light erupted suddenly from the craft as Travis approached hurling him 10 feet backwards, knocking him to the ground. Quickly deciding they had seen enough, the other now petrified loggers immediately fled the scene in the truck. After about 15 minutes, a few of them, full of regret, returned to rescue their friend. But it was already too late. Travis had vanished. They reported Travis missing to the Navajo County Sheriff as soon as they returned home. A night search was conducted, hoping to find Travis but the search was called off a few hours later until the next day. For a further three days, police searched the area and surrounding woodlands, even using a helicopter, but no sign of Travis or any signs of an altercation could be found. His friends and co-workers were totally baffled and spent the next six days being constantly harassed by local reporters, law enforcement and family members. It was widely suggested by the tight-knit community that Travis had been murdered by his colleagues and they were covering it up. The story was spreading fast across the US and Canada and it was decided that all the loggers present that night would sit a polygraph test, a lie detector test. They were to recount their stories of that night. Five passed the test with flying colours and one was inconclusive. The police and others still had their suspicions though. It wasn't until the seventh day when a dazed and confused Travis Walton in the early hours of November the 12th staggered out of the woods several miles away to quash the rumours of foul play. He made a reverse charge call from a petrol garage nearby to his brother Dwayne who immediately drove to pick him up. The telephone operator who took the reverse call recognised Travis's name and reported it to the police. 
When Dwayne got his brother home, the police accused him of the cover-up. But Dwayne insisted that he only had concerns for getting his brother home safely before reporting it. Travis, after a total rest, was then scrutinised to constant interviews and interrogations. Travis claimed that he lost consciousness when struck by the beam of light, and then he awoke in a hospital-like room being observed by three short, bald creatures. He says that he fought with them until a human wearing a helmet led him to another room, where he blacked out as three other humans put a clear mask over his face. Travis said that he remembered nothing else until he found himself walking along a highway five days later with a flying saucer departing above him. Now this was the 70s and a lot of water has flowed under the bridge since then, but all involved have stuck rigidly to their stories. Obviously Travis Walton has become somewhat famous in the UFO community, even though some still refuse to believe him. How does he cope with such interest and sometimes such scepticism over the decades? Travis over the years has stated, my way of handling the abduction has been to kind of push this thing into the background, says Travis, now a father of four. For a long time, I wouldn't talk about this with the media and we never discuss it around the house. Travis also says he was ultimately besieged with so many telephone calls from other abductees that he was forced to discontinue his telephone line for nearly 10 years. It's hard to disbelieve six men who have stuck to their stories for years without caving in to the horrible media, etc. What say you? There have been many, many more abduction cases. Very briefly, Frederick Volantic, an instructor pilot from Australia, went missing in 1978 after reporting to air traffic control that an unknown saucer-shaped object was hovering above his small aircraft. After this, air traffic control lost contact with Frederick and the aircraft was never seen again. In New York City in 1989, Linda Napolitano was abducted in the middle of the night by what she described as a group of short aliens that levitated her out of the apartment window up into a metallic graft. She claims they experimented on her, including inserting something in her nose. X-rays back this up as doctors found a cylindrical object with spiralling extensions in her head. The last one I want to briefly mention happened in Berkshire County, Massachusetts in 1969. This is quite a unique case. As night grew closer, residents started to notice a bright light in the sky. Immediately, according to the police department, over 250 calls came in, all reporting a disc-shaped craft flying erratically over the area. Nine-year-old Thomas Reed, along with his mother, grandmother and brother, were driving along a country road close to where the residents had reported the craft. They all noticed a bright light coming out of the trees. Suddenly, the light pierced the interior of the car, and that's when the family's memories went blank. Next thing they knew, they were travelling in the opposite direction along the same road, and two hours had passed. When they returned home, all their memories slowly started to come back. They all remembered being in some sort of hangar, a large hangar about the size of a football pitch. They can't recall any experiments conducted on them or witnessing any aliens of such, but they know they were taken somewhere without explanation. Over 300 residents of Berkshire County witnessed the spacecraft and it still remains a mystery to this day. There is even a plaque in the town to commemorate the mass sighting. So is this conclusive evidence that alien abductions do happen? These two stories might seem far-fetched and perfectly normal for you to question them and think this could not be possible. But why do authorities around the world insist on a system classifying encounters with extraterrestrial life? Close encounters are the first kind or when you spot something in the sky that you think is unexplainable. Close encounters of the second kind are when a UFO leaves physical evidence, like burn marks in the ground, for instance. Close encounters of the third kind are when you actually make contact with aliens or see the alien in life form. And close encounters of the fourth kind are exactly what we have shown today, abductions.
These official classifications, yes, official classifications, were made by Professor J. Allen Hynek, who was a scientific advisor to the U.S. Forces UFO studies, such as Project Sign or Project Grudge and Project Blue Book from 1947 to 1969, which all exist without any doubt, all government hidings. A few decades into his career, Dr. Hynek began to publicly disagree with his military colleagues about the nature of UFOs. After finishing his work with the Air Force, he went on to create the Centre for UFO Studies and urging the United Nations to create a centralised authority on UFOs. He also believed there was significant evidence to support belief in extraterrestrial intelligence, ETI, and extra-dimensional intelligence, EDI. If these abductions or sightings aren't real, if they are all fabricated, then tell me why governmental organisations and authorities have such classifications. Some experts suggest that sleep paralysis, a condition where the body is temporarily unable to move while the mind is awake, could explain many abduction experiences. During these episodes, the brain can create vivid hallucinations that feel entirely real. Others propose that these experiences might be related to traumatic memories, false memories, or even mass hysteria. So what do you think? Are these stories of alien abductions the result of extraterrestrial visitors? Or are they the product of human psychology and the power of suggestion? Perhaps the truth lies somewhere in between. Do we need to be worried? Can we really get abducted by aliens? And will folk believe us, even if we were? You be the judge. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If so, please help the channel out by clicking the like button so that more people get to see it and also by subscribing. Also, leave a comment if you can. I love reading and replying to them. And sorry when comments get taken down, which seems to be quite often for some reason, but it isn't me doing that. I can promise you. Anyways, don't forget to keep looking to the skies. You never know who's showing interest in you. Anyway, take care. See you in the next video.